Amen. Well, um, if I'm looking a bit bleary-eyed this morning, Louis and I were at a party last night near Guildford, and it went on quite late. It was a party of a friend who's now 50, so we've entered that time where our friends are having 50th birthday parties, which is slightly disconcerting. Um, we've got a few years yet. I've obviously got many, many, many more years than Louis um, together. And, um, no, I meant that the other way around. That's so terrible. <laughs> Louis's got many more years to wait than I have. Um, anyway, before I dig myself into too deep a hole... The party was um, for uh, a man called Martin, who's a, a great friend of ours. And Martin suffered from pancreatitis for uh, the last, um, well, just a number of years. And he's taken the last few years off work. And that's been very um, difficult for the family. It's been difficult for him. It's, um, uh, he's suffered in an extraordinary way. And he he's, has some of the best um, doctors f f work, um, in this area of medicine working on him and um, have been for years. Um, but it was interesting, the, the people who were gathered there, about um, 15, 20 of us, um, one after the other, were all saying how amazing this man was, the time that he gave them, the um, extraordinary wisdom that they went to him and received, the, the fact that he was steadfast in his relationship with God, and that really was a rock for them as they um, kind of traveled their own lives. And again and again, people were just saying, this man is an extraordinary man. He is an extraordinary man. And the thing he said in response was, you know, we are gathered tonight. It was a surprise for him. And um, he came up with this, you know, on the spot. But he just said, we're gathered together. What unites us is the love of God and our love for God. And out of that man's life, even in the midst of great pain and suffering, we just see just such a generosity just flowing out of him. And he would point all of that generosity to Jesus. Today we're looking at the generosity of Jesus. It's in a series uh, about the irresistible Jesus. And I love this series. It's about who Jesus is and all that he does. I get the privilege of talking about one of the, my favorite subjects, generosity, the generosity of Jesus. And it's, it's, uh, you know, it's appropriate to be talking about this subject today, Remembrance Sunday. You know, as we reflect on the generosity of people who have given their lives. That's the ultimate sacrifice, isn't it? They've given their lives in order that we might experience freedom. It's an extraordinary thing. In a way, two minutes doesn't give it justice. At least it's a focus, a national focus for us as we think about their generosity. But um, in this story about Jesus, it's reported in the Gospels, in each of the Gospels, um, the, the story of the feeding of the 5,000. It's, um, it's a story which is so extraordinary, you kind of think, how is this possible? And yet, as you read the story, it's got the ring of truth, just the little details that are there. People were there who kept on talking about it. They remembered it so much, it, it impacted the whole of their lives. How? How did it do that? Let's look at um, some of the things that uh, come out of this passage. I think the first thing I see in this, um, that we might all see, is that Jesus invites us to experience what we need most of all. Look at verse 31. Because so many people were coming and going that, he, that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, the disciples, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. He invites them. It's like a generous spirit behind it saying, come. Come. I know what you need. I know you're exhausted. Um, just that little detail. They were so um, busy, they didn't even have a chance um, to eat because of all the comings and goings of people. Have you ever been in that situation where you just suddenly realize at the end of the day, my, my goodness, I haven't even eaten a meal. I've been so busy. That's what it was like for them. They were exhausted. And Jesus knows exactly what they need. He doesn't hold back um, w with what he offers. He's, he's not um, precious with his time. He says, actually, I know that your deepest need is rest. And the most important thing about that rest is you need to spend time with me. Your experience is going to be most satisfied by spending time with Jesus. And Jesus is just so generous in his very nature. You know, the Father sent Jesus, his one and only Son, into the world um, because he loves us. God so loved the world 
that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. God gave his son, and Jesus gave his life for us out of his generosity. This is, every part of him is generous, and that kind of exudes from him. He has a spirit of generosity. And he says, come, come with me. By yourselves, get some rest. It's an invitation into the very heart of God, to the very center of God's love. That's, the, that's what we need. You'll know the story of, um, uh, there was a, a Spanish father, and he became estranged from his son. Um, his son was called Paco, and um, uh, the father just spent um, many months and years searching for his son. He was just looking, he contacted all the relatives, his friends, he just couldn't find him anywhere. And in the end, out of desperation, he placed an advert in a Madrid newspaper. And the advert read this. Dear Paco, meet me in front of this newspaper office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. That Saturday, 800 Pacos turned up looking for a relationship with their fathers, looking for forgiveness, looking for new life. Jesus says to us, with the love of the Father, come to me. Come, get some rest. Come by yourselves. Come with me. You know, Jesus wants your heart above all else. He wants your life. He wants um, your assent to saying, you know, to all the things that he calls um, you and I into. That's more, you know, more than we can imagine the blessings that he wants to just shower upon us when we come to him. I love you know, the, the symbol of just open arms. You know, the, the, um, the story of the prodigal son um, run, you know, coming to, making that decision to come back to the father even as a slave and he meets the father running towards him with open arms saying, I forgive you. I want to bless you. I want to pour out my love upon you. And Jesus with his arms outstretched on the cross that welcome, that invitation into uh, the love of God as he dies for us. And that's something, that love, that kind of fling our arms wide is something that is a value for us as well. We want to be generous just like um, Jesus is generous to us. It's a value here at St. Paul's. We, um, we want to be generous with our time, with our money, with our energy, with our uh, preferring of others with our mission and evangelism. We want to share the good news that we've received with others. That's a value for us because we've received so much from God. We have a generous God. He wants to see that released in us too. The irresistible Jesus. We can give back to him because we've received so much from him. If you haven't turned to him with every part of your life, if you haven't um, uh, you know, allowed him to forgive you or to fill you or to respond to his call to you, then even today, why don't you do that? Just say, Jesus, I want to respond to your generous, generosity. That generous spirit that we see here. But um, as we read in the story, some things, sometimes things don't quite work out according to plan. Have you experienced that? Um, we have that quite a lot. Um, and they didn't get any rest, um, as it happens. They, the, their rest was being with Jesus on the boat trip. I think it must have been quite a slow boat trip. The winds can't have been very high because you know, the people going around the lake had time to kind of tell everyone, and um, they ran, across, ran around. So it was probably quite a nice day of sailing, sailing with Jesus. Nice um, thing to spend time doing. Um, uh, but... They didn't get any rest in the end, but they did get an adventure. And so the second thing we see after this kind of spirit of generosity is that the love of Jesus overflows to our deepest needs. We see Jesus' heart of generosity. Look at verse um, 34. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he began teaching them many things. He had compassion on them. 
They were like sheep without a shepherd. This is kind of picking up some of the kind of overtones of the um, Old Testament. The sheep without a shepherd was what the um, prophets often described the people of Israel as, as being. They had a king over them, um, you know, a physical king, but actually they weren't fulfilling what they were called to do by God, which was to lead, to shepherd the people, to help them to f- um, point towards God. And instead, they'd been led astray by king after king after king. And so the prophets warned the people and said, you're like sheep without a shepherd. They warned the kings, you must shepherd the people. And of course, the the overtones at that current time, they had Herod as king, who was um, just, uh, you know, abusing his power. He was busy kind of doing kind of evil and nasty things and kind of uh, wicked things off to the side of where he should have been ruling with grace and pointing the people back to God. They were like sheep without a shepherd. And of course, by Jesus kind of even taking this on as his view of the people um, in this way, he's basically saying, you know, I am the true king. I'm going to be the one who has compassion in the way that a king, a true king should have compassion for his people. I'm going to be the shepherd for the lost sheep. I'm going to help you to find your way back to God. And he did that, of course, by giving himself, giving his life on the cross for us. The way we see him doing, exercising this compassion is not just that kind of big picture way. It's actually in the details. He teaches them. Their greatest need was actually to know about him. Their greatest need was to know the ways of God and to know how to follow God. And so he taught them. He gave them what they needed. At the end of a day of teaching, there is um, this kind of great issue (laughs) of um, their practical needs. But even before that, um, the you know that we, I I think we need to get in the way of God's love for his people, that compassionate love, that generous heart that God has for his people. We need to get in the way of that ourselves, for ourselves, to receive that compassion ourselves, but actually to stand in the way and and get so consumed in God's compassion that we begin to have that compassion for other people. You know, it's fantastic praying, interceding in our Sunday services. It's a very important thing. It's actually saying, God, we want your heart for your world. We want to catch what your agenda is, and we want to um, pray those things into being. But there are some God calls who are intercessors, people who um, they, they just can't help but um, praying and um, interceding on behalf of the church, on behalf of the world. And we, we need to prize those people. If that's you, if you feel you know, you, yourself often weeping as you watch the news or um, just uh, crying out to God, God has given you a gift of intercession. And you know, I want to say stoke that gift, you know, stoke the fire of that gift up. We need you in the church. We need you to be those people who are the watchmen, who are watching over, you know, watching for what God is saying, what he's doing. Often people who have that gift of intercession are people who... Um, experience physically this compassion of God. I've seen many times, you know, people weeping and weeping out of um, uh, sorrow for the world around them, out of um, just great love. It consumes them for the people around them. And they are experiencing the heart of God. We want to say, give that. You know, that's a gift to the church. We want to encourage that. We might not always understand it, but we want to encourage that and help us to catch that in a little way ourselves. You know, the world in which we live is just so in need of God's compassionate heart. Mother Teresa, just keep on coming back to her words, these um, famous words of hers. There's a terrible hunger for love in our world. We all experience that in our lives, the pain, the loneliness. We must have the courage to recognize it. The poor you may have right in your own family. Find them, love them, speak tenderly to them. Let there be kindness in your face, in your eyes, in your smile, in the warmth of your greeting. Always have a cheerful smile. Don't only give your care, but give your heart as well. You know, that's such a challenge for me as I look you know, in our neighborhood. I need to see beyond what I see with my eyes. 
There's so much behind closed doors. There's you know, great poverty we already know about in this area that is behind closed doors. There's a poverty of you know, physical poverty, but there's such a poverty of spirit in the people around us. We need to see beyond the kind of just the glance at someone's life and just look into people's eyes and say, Lord, what's going on in the lives of the people around me? Give me your heart for these people. Help me to share your love with these people around me. And you know, God has uniquely chosen you to look out for your neighbor, whether it's in your community, whether it's in your office, whether it's in your network of people you relate to. He's chosen you. And he wants to give you that same heart of compassion that Jesus, we see here. He has compassion on the people. He wants to give that to you as a gift. I think, um, you know, we can allow this irresistible Jesus. I mean, who wouldn't want someone who, uh, around you who actually loves you so much like this? Who has so much compassion for you, gives you exactly what you need? This irresistible Jesus, allow him to change you. Allow him to, um, to touch your heart, to give, him, to give you God's heart for the people around you. It'll change, it will change you. It will be hard. It will be painful. But it will be such a blessing because those people around you will, like the people who were speaking about Martin, I said at the beginning, they will be speaking of you in that way. What a privilege. How can I respond with a generous heart to those around me. On with the story. So it's in verse 35, by this time it was late in the day. So his disciples came to him, this is a remote place and it's already late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. And then these immortal words, I think we can only, it's so easy to just gloss over them. I thought Amanda just you know, pitched it brilliantly. Jesus says, you give them something to eat. And I think you just have to be there, really, or just kind of put yourself in the, in the frame to just experience what that must have felt like. Um, I think it's maybe that kind of sinking feeling that, you, you just, uh, that you're being asked to do something that you are so out of your depth um, that you, you just cannot imagine how to do it. Or you're just being put on the spot and everyone else is looking at it. I mean, he, Jesus would have said it out loud in front of all these people. You feed them. What? No way. It's impossible. I, for me, the first thing I thought about as I was thinking about this is, well, um, obviously I need to, I, I've brought, you know, I've got a little bit of bread. I'm going to feed myself first. And then if there's any left over, then I'll give it to everyone else. That's you know, fair and it's reasonable. You know, it's, I'll, I'll be generous with what I've got left. And um, actually, Jesus doesn't say that. <laughs> what we see here is a practical generosity in Jesus. It's the other, the other side of discipleship. You know, discipleship is about invitation. Come, come with me and get some rest. Come and spend time with me, Jesus says. The other side of invitation is challenge. God invites us to respond to his love, but he also challenges us to respond to his love. And here I think there's a challenge to us to think inside the disciples' shoes. He challenged them. You give them something to eat. You've seen my generosity at work. Now I want you to see this generosity played out in your life as you give to the people around you. And um, uh, they kind of panic, as we see. Um, <laughs> turn over the page. They said to him, that would take almost a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? And they don't understand. Obviously, this is part of their growing understanding of who Jesus is and how he works. But all Jesus asks them to do is to say, what have you got? What have you got? That's what we need. That's all we need. What have you got? Not, not trying to solve the problem logistically. Okay, we'll, just, you know, we'll get this and there's a shop over there. What have you got to the disciples? And they say, well... Um, we haven't got anything, so we'll go and find out from the people. Verse 38, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. When they found out, they said, five loaves and two fish. Love the little detail. Five loaves and two fish. No problems. And Jesus says, that's enough. That's enough for what we have. All he asks for in practical generosity is to give what we have. 
Often it's the little that we have, five loaves and two fish, tiny amounts. I love the little vignette story of um, a, uh, there's an old man that, um, just imagine the deep south in America, who's in a bus and um, kind of rumbling along a, a, a bumpy road. And he has in his hands a bouquet of flowers, fresh flowers. And in this story, there's a girl, a little girl, who's sat on the other side of the aisle in this bus. And she keeps on looking at the bunch of flowers. She can't keep her eyes off them. And as the old man comes to the stop where he's getting off, as he's getting up to leave, he impulsively gives the bunch of flowers to this little girl. And he says this, he says... I'm sure my wife would want you to have these. Please take them. I can see from your eyes how much you love them. And he gave them to her. And then he got off the bus and walked into a little cemetery. Just with the little things that we have, we can change people's lives. Jesus doesn't ask you to give something that you don't have. Jesus asks you to give what you have and to offer it to him. What have you got? I think there's such a challenge here for us. It doesn't matter how small or meager what we have is, we need to say, Jesus, here you are. This is for you. Um, I came across this story um, uh, it was written in the Boston Globe um, a few years ago. And there was this couple who were engaged, and they were going to have a reception in the Hyatt Hotel in Boston. And um, they'd, uh, the, this reception, $13,000 it was going to cost, and they put um, half of it down already, and um, they, uh, they were going to pay the rest when, when the actual reception came about. And... Um, The groom got cold feet, and so he said, "Um, you know, I'm not sure about this, you know, can we put it off for a while? And um, the uh, bride was just so furious that he said, you know, go away, because, you know, they they put all this money down, and um, it was from her own money that she'd kind of put it down. She um, went to the um, hotel um, manager and said, look, you know, the, the groom's kind of got cold feet, and he's... Horrible. And, um, and uh, you know, can we have our money back? And the, the um, manager said, I'm afraid you can't. The contract is binding, and you can just have um, a 10% of it back. So you can either get your 10% back, $1,300, or you can go ahead with the banquet. And um, she went away and thought about it. And the more she thought about it, the more she thought, actually, do you know something? Blow my fiance. I'm just going to have the, I'm going to have a banquet. And so what she did was that she, um, she remembered her past. In the past, she had um, lived in a homeless shelter. She'd kind of fallen on hard times. And she got back on her feet. She'd found a good job. And uh, she had, by this stage, kind of set, set aside quite a sizable nest egg. And she decided to just um, use all her savings on one wild night um, to treat the down and outs in Boston to a a one night of uh, amazing joy and um, pleasure. So so it wasn't the the night that they were going to be married, that was the night where she threw a party. Um, And it's it's described in that newspaper as um, that she hosted a party such as um, this hotel had never seen before. The hostess changed the menu to boneless chicken in in honor of the groom. And... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and sent invitations to rescue missions and homeless shelters. And that night, the paper describes, people used um, to appealing half-gnawed pizzas off a cardboard um, uh, kind of box, dined instead on chicken cordon bleu. Waiters in tuxedos served hors d'oeuvre to senior citizens propped up by crutches and aluminium walkers. Bag ladies, vagrants, and addicts took one night off the hard life on the sidewalks outside and instead sipped champagne, ate chocolate wedding cake, and danced big band melodies late into the night. Isn't that just a wonderful story of someone who just said, I'm just going to be generous, extravagantly generous, in a very practical way. Just like Jesus.
the irresistible Jesus. Fourthly, we just see, in, and this is my final point, is that Jesus draws us into his supernatural generosity. It's his supernatural generosity that flows through all of um, these kind of episodes. Look at verse 41. So, after Jesus got them to sit down in groups on the green grass, so probably in the springtime, um, they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven, Jesus gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And he also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. I think the disciples, I, you, know, like, you know, their circuits basically blew. They remembered this so clearly and vividly. They remember what time of year it was. They remember the specific circumstances around it, how Jesus grouped people in particular numbers. And it transformed their lives because he got them to be involved in this. He takes the offering. He, um, you know, what's been offered. He gives thanks. He, he prays. And then he um, breaks the bread and then gives it to the disciples to distribute. So they've got these five loaves, which have just been broken probably once, something like that. And they're distributed amongst the disciples. And the disciples were basically involved in seeing this half or third loaf, whatever they had in their hands, broken over and over and over and over and over and over again. So they were the people who experienced the miracle. They were the people who had something supernatural going on in their hands as they were distributing this bread. And Jesus drew them in to doing his work. He enabled them to experience something supernatural as Jesus did the big miracle of feeding the 5,000 people who were there. The 5,000 men, probably more, if wives, children were there, maybe 10,000 people, who knows. Jesus multiplies what we offer to him and does something amazing with it. With the small things that we have, Jesus, when we give them to him, will multiply them many, many times and enable people to be satisfied. Isn't that the most extraordinary thing? So the challenge in our culture that is so kind of, um, I need to look after number one, is to give to him, is to give our lives, is to give our time, is to give our money, is to give our energy, is to give our values and our attitudes, all these things, is to give them to him and say, Jesus, do what you want to do with these things. When we do that, extraordinary things happen. I want to just finish with a story um, that I experienced personally, where um, when, before I came here, um, I was, one of my roles at um, Holy Trinity Brompton was to be the chaplain of the Brompton Hospital. I was, um, uh, there are a number of us who fulfilled that role. And what you did was you kind of carried the bleep with you, the emergency bleep, and um, if it went off, you went into the hospital and you just responded to the um, call. Um, one particular night a few years ago, it went off in the middle of the night and um, you kind of don't respond usually very well to start with. <laughs> and then you kind of get on your feet and say, you know, this is part of what I do. And um, so I um, arrived at the hospital and um, there was a, a little boy who'd been born with a damaged heart called Gabriel. And he was just about to go into surgery and the doctor said, it's pretty slim chance that he's going to survive. And so it was one of the things that we often did was we baptized babies just before um, these operations. And the mother um, and father, Teresa and Michael, asked me to baptize Gabriel. And so I did that. And he was a tiny, tiny little boy, um, tubes all over him. And just to remember, you know, I was allowed to, I had to wash my hands carefully. And this, I was allowed to just um, use um, some sterilized water to uh, make the sign of the cross on his head as um, we baptized him. And um, he came through that operation, and he 
um, survived it. He was in and out of hospital a lot in his first few years. And um, uh, Michael and Teresa weren't married. They got married, and Gabriel was a page boy, and it's the most am- am- amazing uh, ceremony. But he was um, in uh, pediatric intensive care you know, most of his life, really. And um, age four years old, he died. And I was invited to the funeral and was a little bit involved in it. And um, what happened at the funeral was extraordinary because there were lots and lots of people there. We were going to do it in a side chapel, but actually we needed to use the main church because there were so many people there who'd come. And they'd come, they were um, families of other people who, whose children had died. There were lots of doctors there, lots of um, the staff, um, lots of friends. And during the tributes that were made, um, the consultant said this. He said, um, my life has been changed by watching the love of this family, and uh, particularly this woman. That was um, Gabriel's mother, Teresa. Their lives have touched many people. They're always smiling, always happy, in spite of the illness of their own son. And Teresa, he said, she was always loving people in practical ways, Carrying her sick child, she always asked after others, are you sleeping enough? Are you in pain? She was always pointing to God and his goodness. Through the experience of um, being loved in, in um, that church, she had come on the Alpha course and she'd given her life to Christ. She'd invited her family to come along as well and many of them had responded. Teresa herself gave her own tribute and she said this. She talks about Gabriel with the love of a mother. But um, her face was a light with life. She talks about how God had helped them and sustained them and loved them. And she said this, I don't ask God, why, why, why have you allowed this? But I ask, why, God, have you allowed us to have a privilege, the privilege of being the parents to such a special boy? When um, Jez, who was here, he actually conducted the burial um, and there were hundreds of people who'd gathered for the burial. It was like, he said it was like a football crowd had come out and um, watched. And, um, you know, after uh, casting the first soil onto the coffin, Teresa um, waved for silence like this. And she said this, we know that Gabriel has gone to heaven. Make sure that you get there too. The irresistible Jesus has this extraordinary generous heart that when we encounter him, when we encounter this generosity, it changes us. We start catching that generosity. It starts rubbing off on us. We can't help it. And I think Jesus says to us today, do you know something? The more you encounter my generosity, the more you will experience it and the more you will have to give away. You can witness in your own lives the kind of experience that those disciples had, where when they received what Jesus had received from them, they received it back and were able to do something that multiplied and multiplied and multiplied, touched the lives of many, many people there. That was just for a one-off occasion. Jesus was demonstrating as the shepherd of the sheep that he's the person who you can turn to. He's the God we can turn to who will have inexhaustible supplies of what we need. He has the ultimate answer to our needs of forgiveness and new life. A life that starts when we come to him and just goes on forever, experiencing more and more of this generous heart. That's the love he has for you. That's the love he has for you right now. That's the love that will break through um, the, the barriers of pain and struggling, the struggle that we have in our lives. It's the barrier, barriers that he will overcome when we l- allow him to, and he will saturate us with this extraordinary, compelling love and generosity. And when he fills you, he does it in such a way that just overflows from you. You cannot help but give away love when you've received the love of God. Would you like to stand?